now it's my pleasure to introduce Rich Pyle. And I just wanted to say a few things. Um, I'm going to let him tell you most of the, the salient parts of his bio. But what I want to tell you is just um, how remarkable he is as a, as a person to work with. I first met Rich when I became associated with the ICZN. Uh, and it, Rich is a commissioner um, in that organization. And I think most of you know that the ICZN, the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, is an organization that focuses on rigor and bibliography and access to information that's relevant to our field in biodiversity. And Rich is one of the most active of the commissioners in that, in that area. So that's obviously a set of traits that he has and excels at. He also excels at a number of other things which are really intriguing. Um, he has an enormous appetite for adventure to the point that he's explored parts of the earth that no human has been before without uh, some kind of a physical protection around them. He's a pioneer of deep diving um, processes and also an engineer in making those, those processes possible. Um, and uh, so he's got, he's got this appetite for, for um, bibliography, science. He's a, a, a taxonomist working on fishes, describing lots of different things. So I mean, really excels in a number of different ways. And in that, he's the only person that I've met who's given two TED Talks on two completely different topics. And he'll tell you, he's going to fuse some of those in the, in the talk today. And I'd like to say that you know we should think that those kind of people are fairly rare. For example, you know, Marie Curie, she only got, she's the only person who's gotten two Nobel Prizes on two different topics. So Rich is sort of in that category of people. <laughs> and when you look at him, you can think of Marie Curie, right? Um, the rest of it, I think I'm just going to let him tell you where he's from, what he's done, and how that all should be um, in, of interest to you in your, in your work as a researcher or as a person um, engaging the world in biological research. Thanks. Thank you, Eleanor, for that somewhat hyperbolic introduction. Um, I thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. I'm a little nervous. I didn't know this many people were going to be here, and I'm sure you're from different backgrounds and disciplines, and that's why I actually like to give this talk, because this is the talk I give that merges all of my worlds. As Eleanor alluded to, I live in various different worlds, and this gives me a chance to touch on most of them. Over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, I'm going to tell you two basic stories. The first story I'm going to tell you is kind of a short story. It's my own story about the research I do and the science I do. And I have to correct Eleanor slightly on one thing. It's not a hunger for adventure. Uh, a good friend of mine, Bill Stone, who's a cave explorer, once said, the difference between adventure and exploration is data. And what I like is the data side of stuff. Um, uh, you know, to me, it's not about the adventure. It's about coming back with information we didn't have before. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that side of what I do. And, and, and one of the aspects, all of the worlds that I live in, I'm a nerd in, a pretty hardcore nerd in. So I'll tell you about those. The second story I'm going to tell you is something probably most of you in this room already know this story. And you know it pretty well. And you're probably much more expert in that story than I am. But I'll give it to you in a way, I'll explain it in a way that maybe you haven't heard explained before. And then I'll lead up to why I explain it in that form. So without further ado, let me start with my story. This is me a while ago um, <laughs> as an undergraduate. Uh, at this point in my life, I was absolutely above all else a fish nerd. I, everything I wanted to do in life was about fish, particularly coral reef fish. I kept aquariums. I read all the books. I wanted to be a fish. And this guy right here, his name is Jack Randall, is the uber fish nerd of all time. He's named more species of coral reef fishes than anyone in history, which is remarkable considering that there were 200 years prior to him for people to have found things. He managed to find uh, so many more new fishes that nobody before him had found because he started adopting a brand new technology at his time, scuba gear. He started using scuba in 1946, which is before when Jacques Cousteau popularized it. So he applied this new technology to his personal passion for exploration, not adventure, to go out and find new species of fishes. And so he became my mentor. Um, even before I was a graduate student, he, uh, he and I 
uh, got to know each other fairly well. In particular, we got to know each other in Palau. After uh, my first semester in college, I decided academic life wasn't for me. Um, I wanted to go live a more interesting life. I went and lived in Palau, uh, a remote uh, Pacific group of islands. And then Jack Randall came to visit, and I got to know him, and we went diving together. And Jack is known for finding all these new species and being a fish nerd. I wanted to find new species. And every time I'd go find something that I'd never seen before, I'd bring it up and show him. He'd say, oh, yeah, I found that one in 1965, and I named it after my daughter and, you know, whatever. So the only way I could find things that even rose his interest was to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So I kept going deeper and deeper to the point where I was going deeper even than he had been before. And that led to a bit of a problem. Two days after that photo was taken, I was paralyzed. I, I had a diving accident. I went too deep. I stayed too long, ran out of air, came up too fast, and got quadriplegia from it, from the bends, uh, decompression sickness. Um, and it took me a year to learn how to walk again. So it was a pretty traumatic thing for a 19-year-old to undergo. But during that year, uh, you know, I, at that point, I had already been bitten by the bug of exploration. And it, specifically, what I was really excited about was the fact that most scuba divers throughout the history of undersea exploration can go down safely to about 50 meters. Some go quite a bit deeper than that, but it gets sort of logistically difficult to do science at greater depths than 50 meters. So to go deeper, you need submersibles. But submersibles are really, really expensive, and the vast, vast majority of submersibles go far deeper than 150 meters. So there's this zone in the middle that's kind of been ignored throughout history on coral reefs throughout the world. And I originally started calling the twilight zone because it was a cool thing. And it was also an apt term because this is the depth zone that represents the transition between well-lit shallow depths and these perpetual dark depths. So it's middle, midday, tropical sun. The light levels down there are sort of what you see at around sunset time. It's very twilight. But then it was a little non-scientific, and uh, the, that term had been applied to other environments, so I had to come up with a different term. So for a while, I referred to them simply as deep coral reefs. But that, that sort of got confusing when people discovered coral reefs thousands of feet deep, uh, totally different kind of habitat. Those were called deep coral reefs, so people would get confused. So for a while, I didn't know what to call them. Um, so I was going giving presentations on deeper portions of typical shallow tropical coral reefs. And then the U.S. federal government finally came to the rescue and came up with this term, mesophotic coral ecosystems, which is about the opposite end of the spectrum from twilight zone in sex appeal and fundability. But that's what we now call them. So these, these are these mesophotic coral ecosystems is what, what I like to explore. So as a 19-year-old, this was my passion. I wanted to fill in all those question marks. And submarines were out of my league. They cost something on the scale of uh, thirty to $50,000 a day to use one of these things. That's out of most researchers' budgets, certainly out of a graduate student or an undergraduate's budget. And uh, during this year I spent recovering, I basically learned about what options there were to extend scuba. And one of them is something called a closed-circuit rebreather. I could spend an hour talking about them, I won't, but basically it's a high-tech version of scuba that recirculates your breathing gases, uses computers to control the amount of oxygen and so on. And this is an early prototype of a very sophisticated rebreather developed back in the 80s, cis lunar. This is the fourth generation prototype. And uh, this launched me down a whole new path, a whole new um, part of my life, which was thinking about how to design life support equipment. And that's been a part of my life actually now for the last couple of decades. This picture right here shows that prototype Mark IV rebreather and uh, my prototype child, my uh, daughter, age two days. Uh, this is the, literally the day we brought her home from the hospital, and I show this picture just to reinforce, when I say I'm a nerd, I really mean I'm a nerd, not just for fish, but for dive equipment, too. If the first thing I do with my newborn daughter when I bring her home is strap her in the equipment to snap this photo. This is that same person <laughs> at the same age I was when I had my diving accident, 19 years old, and to her side there is the same rebreather I had strapped her in as a child. What she's wearing on her back is now the seventh generation of that same line of rebreathers, so we've gone through multiple iterations of redesigning this life support equipment, and that's another whole hour talk I could give if, you, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, but what I'm going to talk about now is what I use this equipment for, and what I've used it for is to take around the Pacific and uh, look for new species of coral reef fishes, because that's my passion. So this shows you, during those 20 years that my daughter was growing up, this shows you where we took all this gear. Um, and you can see it's quite a few places. And this is just a small sampling of the new species of fishes we found on these deep coral reefs in that mesophotic coral ecosystem at these places we've been. Now, these are just the ones that are kind of pretty to look at, that we happen to have good photographs of, so on. So this, if I 
put in the full slide of this, it could go on and on and on and on. So we're finding quite a lot of new species of, of fishes on these coral reefs simply by going to an environment where no one's ever been before. Um, so this is actually what's been driving almost everything I do uh, all along up until this point. Now remember that one in the center, I'll come back to that one in a minute. Now just to show you how many new species uh, we're talking about, uh, this is a data set we have from one expedition in Fiji. This is the number of uh, collection stations we did at each of those depths. Not a big sample size, but you can see we did several collections at each of these depth zones. This is the total number of species of fishes we collected at each of those depth zones. And as you'd expect, there are more total species in the shallow reefs. And as you go deeper and deeper, they tend to peter off a little bit. Not too much, but there are fewer and fewer. And we knew that. As you get farther and away from the sunlight, you get uh, less and less fish diversity. But what's interesting is the new species, species new to science, we picked up from just this expedition alone, none up shallow, and that's because the shallow reefs are really well explored. There's very few new things to find up there, but as we went deeper and deeper and deeper, we found more and more new species of fish, and this is amplified by when you consider how much time we actually spent at each of those depth zones collecting specimens. So if you control for time, what you get on that far column over there is the new species per unit effort. Those are the numbers of new species of coral reef fish we find per hour of time at those depths. Now, if you're an entomologist or a mycologist, you can probably find environments and find this many new species that quickly. But if you study vertebrates, there aren't many places in the world where you can find nearly 30 new species per hour of exploration time. So clearly, there's a lot of undiscovered biodiversity on these deep coral reefs. And it's not just new species we're finding. We're finding really extraordinary and unexpected patterns. This shows you the percent overlap of species diversity at these three localities that we happen to have pretty good data for for the shallow coral reef species. So you can see somewhere in the range of 50 to 63 percent species overlap among these locations. If you look at the deep coral reefs, those numbers are much smaller. There's much less species overlap, and we've looked at this in, in the context of sample sizes. So these numbers are fairly representative of what's actually out there on the reef. And what that means is if you have less overlap in species between any two localities, you tend to, on average, have higher rates of endemism. For those of you who don't know, endemism is when a species occurs in only one restricted place in the world. So we're finding much higher rates of endemism on these deep coral reefs than we expected to. And this picture illustrates that. It was taken at a depth of about 100 meters off Hawaii. And not only is almost every, every species you see, but Every fish in this photograph, except for two individual fish, is endemic to the Hawaiian Islands. So not only do we find more endemic species down on deep coral reefs, but the deep coral reefs are dominated by endemic species in terms of abundance. Um, this has led us down a path uh, that has opened up a whole new door in biogeographic patterns. There's other really strange things we're finding about the biogeography of these deep coral reefs that are very different from the shallow coral reefs. So if you're into uh, Pacific biodiversity, biogeography and patterns there. Uh, I'd love to tell you about that. I could talk an hour about it, but I won't right now. But the point is there's lots of science behind what we're doing, lots of exciting science, and we're on the brink of getting enough data that we can actually start demonstrating these things quantitatively. I put this slide in to remind me that there are other living things in the ocean besides fish. Uh, this is a photograph taken on one of these deep reefs on a recent expedition by my colleague uh, Sonia Rowley, Dr. Sonia Rowley. Her parents are here today. Um, she's here from UK, but she lives in Hawaii now where it's nice and warm and sunny. And she studies marine invertebrates, particularly she studies Gorgonian corals. And I had always wondered whether these patterns I'm seeing in fishes are unique to fishes or not. And the patterns she's beginning to see in Gorgonian corals um, are pretty much following in line with the same things that we're finding for fishes. So if corals and fishes tend to follow the same patterns, it might be something more generic to all of biology. The main difference is she's finding new species at a much faster rate than we are, believe it or not. So the invertebrate world is, is incredible down on these deep coral reefs. Um, it's a whole world waiting to be explored. So I hope I've left you with this phase one of my presentation, this knowledge that there are environments out there, and the deep coral reefs are one, that are largely unexplored and have many lifetimes worth of work to, to do to fill in uh, the rest of the exploration. So in that context, I'm going to over, shift over to the second story. And the second story I'm going to tell, I'm going to start at the end of the story and work my way back to the beginning. So this is the end of the story. This picture was taken off uh, South Africa at a depth of about 120 meters, 400 feet, where two large vertebrates encountered each other. I'll introduce you to these two large vertebrates. Uh, the one on the left is me. 
the one on the right is a coelacanth. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know what a coelacanth is. There's one up on display here in the main hall. It's basically a living dinosaur. It's, uh, it's one of the most extraordinary vertebrates alive today. It was discovered originally off South Africa in the 1930s. It was heralded as one of the greatest biological discoveries of the 20th century, right up there next to the elucidation of DNA by Watson and Crick. You see it on those kinds of lists. So it's a really, really big, exciting deal. And I had the good fortune of being able to go dive with one of these things a few years ago, several of them actually. But I use this as my ending point of my story to say, let's trace back the history of these two vertebrates that met off South Africa to see when they last met back in time. So I, I, at the time, I was about 40 years old. And I'm still in the 40 decade bracket. So I'm, it's safe to say I'm about 40 years old. These are my parents. I was born 40 years ago. And it turns out coelacanths live about the same length that humans live. So for the sake of argument, let's say that the coelacanth I encountered was roughly the same age. And it had parents that lived roughly the same time as my parents about 40 years ago, somewhere on a reef off South Africa. So let's go back another power of 10. Instead of 40 years, let's go back 400 years. So my mom turns out to be into genealogy, and she's actually traced our ancestry back. And it's, as it happens, you can trace my ancestry back generation after generation. And about 400 years ago, you encounter this guy, whose name is Miles Standish. Uh, he was one of the original colonists on the Mayflower and the original leader of the, the colonies, the British colonies here, not here on this continent, left this continent, went to the other continent. Um, so that's sort of an interesting footnote of my own personal history. I, I read a little bit of biography of him, and I'm not particularly proud to call myself a descendant of him, but facts are what they are. So in any case, if you trace the coelacanth's lineage back generation after generation after generation after generation, you come 400 years ago to a coelacanth thing that lived somewhere off South Africa, most likely. All right, let's go now another power of 10. So instead of 400 years, we're going to look back 4,000 years. And so now, if you trace my ancestry back 4,000 years, based on my genomics and 23andMe and other things I've looked at, most likely my ancestry was living in Mesopotamia somewhere. I don't think he looked anything like that, but that's what Wikimedia says of someone from Mesopotamia looked like, so that's what I put in there. But the important point about this is those little circles connecting us, that's a physical thing. That's a real thing. And what that is is a series of reproductive events, right? Generation after generation after generation. This is an actual connection. It's not just an abstract, oh, yes, he was my ancestor. But you could, if you were diligent enough and had the records, trace generation after generation the actual individual reproductive events that started with some guy who might have looked like that, might not have, and led to me today. And you can do the same thing with the coelacanth if we had that information. We could trace back reproductive event after reproductive event, 4,000 years to find a coelacanth that probably lives somewhere in the Western Indian Ocean. All right, another power of 10. So now we're going to go 40,000 years back in time. And now it's getting a little interesting. So my ancestors were colonizing this continent about then, uh, colonizing Europe about 40,000 years ago. And the coelacanth's ancestors, well, nobody knows, but it, it, it was a coelacanth living off of Africa. We'll come back to that side of the story in a minute. Another power of 10. So now we're going 400,000 years back. Okay? So here, these are powers of 10, remind you. My ancestors were living in Africa and just starting to figure out how to deal with fire and how to harness fire and use fire. Now we're getting into time scales where actually people started thinking of the populations of my ancestors as being a different species from me. So in theory, I'm Homo sapiens and the species Homo heidelbergensis is who I sort of descended from. That species is not only my ancestor, but again, if you believe the modern view of things, um, it's also the, the common ancestor between me and Homo neanderthalensis. So this is the time scale where we start to see patterns of divergence that are getting in line with what we call species. And for now, we'll just say the coelacanth side of the story is, I'll come back to that side in a little bit. All right, so now let's go another power of 10. Now we're talking four million years ago. Four million years ago was when um, my ancestor Lucy was walking around, Australopithecus. Um, she wasn't just my ancestor. She was the ancestor of what seems to be a plethora, depending on if you're a splitter or a lumper, how many different uh, species of hominids have existed over the last four million years. See Lacant's side, not getting all that interesting yet. <laughs> now another power of 10. Now 40 million years. 40 million years ago, to the best of what we can figure, my ancestor looked kind of something like that. Obviously, I don't know if it had spots. I don't know what its tail looked like. But the best of our knowledge is, is our mammalian ancestors were scurrying around uh, in the forest back then. And again, not just our collective ancestors, but the ancestors to all modern lemurs, monkeys, and apes. 
Now the coelacanth side of the story. I finally have something to say because at this point you're thinking, how did I change so much from that to that in 40 million years? And I keep showing the same picture over here for the coelacanth. And believe it or not, we have reasonably good reason to believe that that's probably true. And the reason we have for believing that is there's actually two species of coelacanths alive today that are known. One that lives in Indonesia and one that lives off Africa. And they were recently subjected to a whole genome analysis and that analysis suggested that they split about 30 million years ago. And if you look at the living examples of those two populations today, they are almost indistinguishable. In fact, it was a while before they even decided to give a new name to the Indonesian one. But morphologically, in terms of color, behavior, habitat, they are almost identical, yet they split 30 million years ago. So if the two living examples of coelacanths that look nearly identical um, today split 30 million years ago, then 40 million years ago their common ancestor almost certainly looked more or less the same way they do. So let's go back 400 million years, another power of 10. And here is where those two vertebrates who met off South Africa finally find their original meeting point in a common ancestor, which from the fossil record, artist rendition, probably looked a little something like that. And that wasn't just the ancestor of me and the coelacanth that I bumped into, but it was also the ancestor of all modern vertebrates. And just to give you a sense for time scale, that's where the dinosaurs fit into this story. So it's a pretty far back period of time. It's a pretty incomprehensible to us uh, vision of, of uh, time scales. We, our brains really aren't adept at, at comprehending what 100 million years means. Um, but these lines are not just abstract lines. Re again, remember, those lines represent actual reproductive events. Millions and millions and millions of reproductive events, unbroken chain from that common ancestor both to me and to the coelacanth. But the story is not at the beginning yet. We've still got one more power of 10 to go. So if we go back one more power of 10, that's where we're starting to see the origin of life. Four billion years, plus or minus, argue about the actual numbers. But this is all living things on this planet. And obviously, those are just sort of emblematic representations. Um, there is an incredible diversity of stuff we find living today. And that stuff is just a tiny fraction of all the stuff that has ever lived. I find that in itself kind of remarkable. Well, what's really remarkable is how this plethora all comes back to a common ancestor. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, but I just want to get these numbers up there. These are just general estimations of how many species of life, depending on how you define a spe species, especially on the right half of that graph, um, that live on Earth. We, we only know a small percentage of them. I'll come back to that also in a minute. But what I want to explain about that tree that I just showed you is how interesting and powerful it is. So if an intelligent being from another galaxy visited our solar system, and they came and they saw the sun orbited by these things. They'd find one of these planets much more interesting than the other ones. And it wouldn't be the one, big one with the rings. It wouldn't be the huge one with the red spot. There's one planet that would stand out from the others. And that's the planet that would stand out. Now, the first reason you might think it'll stand out is because it has liquid water. What makes Earth different, of course, is not the water, but what the water is allowed to happen, which is biodiversity. This is what makes Earth exceptional among the planets in our solar system and exceptional as far as we know among the nearby planets in our galaxy and beyond that we have no clue. Uh, but the point is biodiversity is what's really interesting and to me the most interesting thing about it is what separates non-living chemistry from life and that is information. Those lines, those reproductive events that unite and connect every living thing on the planet, everything that has ever lived on the planet is information. A reproductive event passes very little matter. You know, if it's sexual reproduction, we're talking about a sperm and an egg cell, those molecules are probably gone by the time you're at a fairly young age. But the information they contained is what gets perpetuated link after link after link of those chain. If any link is broken anywhere in that chain of millions and millions, billions of generations, then a lineage goes extinct. So all of us in the room, all living things alive today, are the endpoint of a four billion year old chain of information flow. And when I think about life in terms of information and the information it represents, I think of it as like a library. So we're not really talking about 30, 10 to 30 million species. We could also think about it as talking about 10 to 30 million stories. 
And these stories are embedded in our genomes, and our genomes have been edited and re-edited and fine-tuned over the course of these four billion years through natural selection and maybe other processes as well that have led to what we see around us in the, in the biodiversity, the biosphere today. And these aren't just any stories. These are stories of survival. They're all nonfiction stories. All of this information that's embedded in the global genome, in the glo not just the genome, but the way that organisms interact with each other, this network of information is the most valuable pocket of information that exists anywhere in our solar system and probably this vicinity of the galaxy. It, it's truly extraordinary. So if you think of biodiversity as a library, this is the Library of Congress, we at Human History right now are about at the level of kindergartners. So imagine a little group of kindergartners running through this Library of Congress. And when I say kindergartners, what I mean is our ability to read and interpret the information in that genome is at about the level of C spot run, right? We've kind of got the words worked out. We're starting to get a little bit of the sentence structure. We can even start to string sentences together into paragraphs. But really, we're just beginning to learn what the real value of this informatic content is. Somewhere buried in that global genomic information, those 10 to 30 million stories of survival, is going to be a lot of really fascinating, really pertinent, really useful information for the, all, the entire future of humanity. You don't just throw away four billion years of accumulated wisdom and expect to lose nothing. And I guess the point I always try to make is we are really only at the very beginning of understanding the enormity of that information. These kindergartners running around the Library of Congress are taking books off shelves, they're building forts out of them, they're ripping paper out, they're coloring them, maybe some of the naughty ones are lighting them on fire. Uh, whatever they do with books, but they're unaware that they're completely surrounded by the works of Shakespeare and Homer and plans, blueprints to build nuclear power reactors. So my point is that genome, that global four billion year old genome probably contains information as much as great if not greater value to us than those other pieces of information like nuclear power plants and computers and all of that that we're only just beginning to understand but we're fast learners we're learning very quickly um, you know if you track the pace of technology and our ability to understand the genome you can see that it's very accelerative it's moving faster and faster so we're on track to become toddlers and then after toddlers we'll, we'll become you know grade school students and then eventually high school students so we're learning fairly quickly about this information but there is a problem, and the problem is this. If you take total global biodiversity as something up there in the 20 million species range, plus or minus, we could argue about that. Um, if you track the history of building the card catalog to this, this extraordinary library, that's our progress so far. Um, it's not particularly good, and it's actually a little unnerving when you factor in something else into the equation, which is that there's growing evidence that we're at the dawn of what's known as the sixth great extinction. We've had five great extinctions in the history of the Earth where large percentages of uh, biodiversity had gone extinct. Um, and now we seem to be at the dawn of the sixth great extinction. We don't know how dramatic it's going to be. We don't know how fast it's going to be. Most of the things I've read about it are fairly ominous. So you can see we have a little bit of a problem here. If we continue our current pace of building the card catalog of this library, which is clearly burning, it's clearly on fire, We've got a problem ahead of us. And if you think that the Library of Alexandria, you know, had lost treasures to history, that was trivial. That was nothing compared to the value of the information in the Global Biodiversity Library that we are potentially at risk of losing at this point in human history. So the answer is something needs to happen. And this is a slide, a concept that came out about 15 years ago through um, the All Species Foundation. There was a group of Silicon Valley billionaires who decided that the, the world's greatest philanthropic endeavor would be to document every species of life on Earth. It got some traction. It was getting going right up until the point where uh, the, the stock market crashed and then uh, suddenly the billions of dollars weren't there anymore. But the ideas remain. And the idea is that if we're ever going to try to win this race against um, what's happening in the biodiversity and try to preserve the scrolls of the Library of Alexandria, if we're going to try to do that, we've got to be thinking about new inventive ways to change the paradigm. So there's a few things that we can start thinking about. Now I showed this to slide before and it sort of misleads you into thinking that half the world over there is eukaryotes and half the world over here is prokaryotes. As uh, my friend Brian Tyndall knows well, that's not an accurate representation of biodiversity. This might look a little something more like it. 
Um, the reason I show you this is because a great deal of the biodiversity is this tiny set of organisms that we can learn a lot about very quickly through DNA sequencing. Um, and so DNA sequencing technology could be one of those keys that allows that inflection point in that graph for us to begin to understand the true scope of the, the genomic biodiversity world that we live in. But that doesn't really help us with that little chunk over there on the left, uh, in all the, the eukaryotes. So we still need other ways of approaching things. So here's another way that the world is changing in ways that might help us. This is Carl Linnaeus. He's the one who started the Dewey Decimal System for biology, uh, using the library metaphor. He came up with the method of uh, assigning scientific names to organisms so we could start uh, categorizing them, labeling them, and then classifying them. Two seminal works, 1753, Species Plantarum, and then a few years later, Systema Naturae. These were the beginnings of our modern system of how we catalog biodiversity, how we assign names to things and how we classify them. Now, up until a few years ago, the way this had been done for 250 years remained pretty much unchanged. Uh, this is a picture of me in my office at the Bishop Museum. As you can see, the only windows in my office are those designed by Microsoft. Um, and this is one of the other nerd worlds that I live in, which is biodiversity informatics. I spend most of my days sitting at those computer screens programming databases. It's information management. And so the reason I do that and the theme about which I do that is finding ways to digitally come up with digital modern internet-based replacements to the 250-year ink on paper way that we used to catalog biodiversity. So I'll just give you sort of one example. This is that fish I showed you early on in the middle of the screen. This is one of these new species. So this is a, a frame grab of me collecting what is the holotype of that species. And what's interesting about that species is it's one of five that we named in a publication on January 1st, 2008. And we selected that date because it was symbolically to the day, 250 years after the beginning of all zoological nomenclature. And so two things happened in this publication. One is that we had nearly 300 hyperlinks embedded in it. It still had to be published on paper because back then the rules required new species get named in on ink on paper uh, durable media. Um, but we, the PDF version of this had lots and lots and lots of hyperlinks in it. And so those hyperlinks would allow you from the original description, one mouse click away, be able to tap into all these external resources. And also the other significant thing is that paper launched this thing called Zoobank. So this is where I put on my name nerd hat. Uh, as Eleanor mentioned, I was, I'm a commissioner of the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature, and one of our big projects over the last several years is de developing an online registry for new scientific names of animals. So that's what happens in that windowless office, is the development of the zoo bank. This is online electronic registry of all new names. So trying to digitize all this information and mobilize it is one of the ways that we can start to streamline the process. So if you think about biodiversity and what all of humanity has collectively learned about biodiversity, where is all that information? Well, a lot of it's in museums like this one right here um, in, in the form of specimens, in specimen collections. That's where a huge, a huge body of our knowledge of biodiversity exists. Another huge body of our, our knowledge of biodiversity exists in literature, uh, historical literature, as well as modern literature that's being published in new journals, more modern journals. So, so literature is another place where biodiversity information exists. Databases about scientific names of organisms, there's lots and lots and lots of those. Those have some of the, the, the Dewey Decimal System, the card catalog systems. And then there are species catalogs. Those are sort of a layer up from the names. These are the actual species and, and, uh, and information about them. And then there's observations databases. And then there's, of course, the whole genomics world. And that one's probably going to grow to dwarf all of these others in terms of where the information is. Um, there's, there's multimedia places that capture images of organisms. There's information about biodiversity in those places. These are aggregators. These are groups that try to pull all the information together from these different sources. And then, of course, you've got the internet, the internets. You've got this incredible diversity of information that's out there on web pages scattered around the world. So one thing that unites all this biodiversity is taxonomy. That's another hat I wear. I'm a taxonomist. That's my job, is, is finding new species and, and putting names on them and figuring out their classifications. So the way you bridge together and link together all this information that we've accumulated over the hundreds of years that we've been researching uh, organisms is you link it all together. So there are initiatives underway right now to leverage this historical 250-year legacy of taxon names to bridge them all together 
in an electronic format. And one of the keys to that are these things called globally unique identifiers. And again, I could talk for an hour on that. I would definitely bore you to tears if I did. Um, but the point is, we're developing these architectures right now, and it's an exciting time in history. Uh, this is all part of what's called the global name architecture, to try to bring together and mobilize and, and gain action to all this information. So trying to digitize and interlink all of this biodiversity information is one more way we can start to get our handle around this global biodiversity. But what you're looking up here is the real impediment, right? This is the real thing that's stopping us from really trying to save this giant biodiversity library is burning and how do we stop it? And we need these things. So I did a little inquiry into saying, well, where do we spend our money in science? And so I'm just gonna give you a little, a little sort of sample and I get to play with orders of magnitude again here. So the National Science Foundation in the United States had a program that's now discontinued, but it was called Planetary Biodiversity Inventory. And it was a set of money specifically designed to do what I'm talking about, going out, discovering new species, documenting them, getting them names, getting, getting, building the card catalog of this global biodiversity. And the maximum amount they'd give per grant was $3 million. That's a scale in, in millions of dollars which sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, especially for those of us who work in taxonomy. What if we took the entire 10-year period of that PBI initiative? The entire 10-year period was about $30 million. Imagine if we had all that money, $30 million. That's how much money the National Science Foundation in the US sunk into trying to solve this problem of the global biodiversity library problem. All right, so that's starting to give you a little bit of scale. But now, we shifted a power of 10 to get there. Let's shift another power of 10. So now our scale is up to $500 million. This is going to get, show you a few things. This is the entire National Science Foundation Division of Environmental Biology. So this is basically what their, their, their environmental biology budget is on an annual basis, $144 million US. And I apologize, these are in US dollars. That's how my brain works. This three times larger graph is a single space shuttle launch, OK? One space shuttle launch is three times as much money as the entire annual budget for all biological, environmental biological research in the US. All right, you're starting to see the pattern that you'll see more of here. Let's go another power of 10. So let's go to, to $50,000 million, $50 billion. All right, what's on that scale? Well, this is the entire National Science Foundation budget annual budget. That's the whole, that's for all forms of research, not just biological, physics, everything else that they support. Okay, this is the Large, ha large Hadron Collider, right? So that's a big project. That's, that one project, that one thing, is more than the entire annual budget of the National Science Foundation in the US. Here's the Human Genome Project. That's probably our biggest biological monumental project that we've managed to pull off. $15 billion when you add up all the dollars from all the different sources, okay? There's the annual budget of NASA. So the Human Genome Project's actually on par with the annual budget of NASA. Never mind that the Human Genome Project spanned many, many, many years, and that's one year's worth of NASA funding. This is the Manhattan Project, okay, in 2012 dollars. So building a nuclear bomb, which I guess is justifiably more uh, important to most people, I suppose. Um, but look at the scale now. We're now a thousand times more money then it is the entire PBI project. So now we're, we're already saying that developing a nuclear bomb was worth a thousand times more than building the, uh, the catalog of the Global Biodiversity Initiative. And of course, we've got another power of 10 to go. So this is the International Space Station, $150 billion. The total space shuttle budget over the course of its existence, nearly $200 billion. And the Apollo 11 program landing on a moon, bringing them safely back, uh, $207 billion. So the reason I show this is not to say, wow, wow, we want that money too. Well, it kind of is. Um, but it shows that we as an international community, not just in the US, but as an international community, we have funded big science before. We do care about big science. We do find ways to come up with the money to fund things four orders of magnitude more than we've been able to fund the, the kind of research we need to save this library. And one of the missing components is helping people to understand why is biodiversity as important as space exploration? Why is biodiversity as important as the Higgs boson? Why does it matter? And I think most people think of biodiversity in terms of what they see in zoos and their, their garden out back and all of that, and that's great. But if we could find a way to really get home the fact that biodiversity isn't just 
you know, the question is the wrong question. We shouldn't be asking why is biodiversity as important as that. We should be asking why does having an orbiting laboratory come anywhere near to the value of trying to understand the world's greatest library, the most precious asset this planet has had, this four billion years of accumulated genomic wisdom, and we're losing it, and it's burning, and we're throwing pennies at it compared to the, the amount of money. The physics that we're learning from the LHC and from outer space, those physics are still going to be there 100 years from now. They're still going to be there a 1,000 years from now. If human civilization can survive, we've got plenty of time to answer those questions. We do not have the same time to deal with the biodiversity situation because it will be gone long before we have a chance to really do it. So this is a quote from a friend of mine, Sylvia Earle. What we do or fail to do in the next 10 years will have a magnified impact on the next 10,000 years. And what she means by that, and I know because I helped her come up with this, um, <laughs> is, is that we are at a pivotal point in human history right now. We're at a convergence. We are probably the first generation of human beings to get our heads around the true nature of biodiversity, its scope, how big it is. And we're also the first generation to realize how imperiled it is. We have this tiny little overlap in human history between being aware of a problem and being in a position to do anything about it. If we wait too much longer, we'll no longer have the opportunity to go back and undo the damage that's done. So we are at this... She says 10 years, I'm thinking more like 15, 20, 25, maybe 50 years. We're at this window of period within a single human lifespan on that scale of all those billions of years, this little window of time between we're aware, we're aware of a situation or we can be aware of a situation. The smarter kindergartners are beginning to figure it out. And, and we still potentially have an ability to put out the fire, to, to save the library. And so... We need to be thinking as biologists, as people who care about biodiversity, is how do we start that process? We can't snap our fingers and next year have a hundred billion dollars waiting for us to explore biodiversity. But we can start doing whatever it is the astronomers did, whatever it is the particle physicists did, to organize themselves, to start explaining their message, coming up with a cohesive message, making sure it falls into the right ears. It might take decades to acquire, but if we don't start now, we won't have an opportunity later and generations after us will probably hate us for it. So that's my sermon, that's my message. It ties together my worlds and I appreciate your attention um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any, thank you. Sure. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. so, can, I, you, can you use the microphone because this is all being recorded? Thanks. Well, I, I can repeat the question. So, so, so the point, the valid, very valid point is that we're at the sixth great extinction because we've had five of them already, yet somehow here we are. And that's a very fair point. And actually, I'm not even that worried about most of the biodiversity. Most of the biodiversity uh, on this side of the graph is still going to be here after the sixth great extinction, the, the small microbial stuff. And I guess my only counterpoint to that is that it took a number of millions of years, 70-ish millions of years, to sort of bounce back from the last one. I don't know if humans are going to be around that long. I, I think the real motivation is humans. I mean, you know, if we were worried about planet Earth, the answer is easy. We all commit suicide and get our species off this planet, let the rest of the Earth go on. That's, that's a no-brainer. Unfortunately, that doesn't appeal to politicians very much. Uh, um, it's not really appealing to me either. So I guess the answer to your question, I think, is that I frame it in terms of what matters to humans in the next, say, 10 to 100 generations from now. And I would say that the world they're going to lose, and even if it is mostly prokaryotes, I mean eukaryotes that we lose in the next 100 years, I would argue that there's probably information among those things that are going to disappear, including their microbial symbionts, that might hold keys to cures to diseases, that might hold keys to efficient ways to manipulate molecules at that scale. So, so I, even though, yes, in terms of the planet Earth, in terms of biodiversity, we've survived five extinctions before, we'll survive this, we meaning planet Earth, will survive it again. But I think from a human perspective, and we are, after all, humans trying to decide what we're going to do with our time and energy, we should probably focus on the ones that are most directly relevant to us. And I would say that that sixth extinction, if it's really coming in the next several generations of humans, will probably have a pretty acute impact on us one way or another. I don't know if that addresses your question, but... So Rich, um, one of the slides that 
you showed had you know the eukaryotic diversity and the sort of the macrobiota on the left hand side, and you had this impressive diversity of of the the um, prokaryotic, the archaeobacteria, the bacteria on on the right, and you you mentioned um, intriguingly to me that. On the one side of that, on the right-hand side, we might be able to sequence our way to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And on the left-hand side, we would you know, use and, and continue to need to bring together our legacy data and our knowledge um, using um, a different set of techniques. I, I wonder, I mean, maybe that's um, a broad brush on, on mm -hmm. the, the present and the future. But I'm curious to see where the intersections are between how we can use genomic techniques and, and biodiversity geno genomics along with our, our legacy data together to, c to get a better handle on how to more rapidly assess and, and determine the diversity that's out there to help us that on that ramp. Right. So I'm curious if that's, that, that's like a, a, a strong division that you drew in the a line on that on the, down the middle of that graph or whether there might be more of an integrative view that you can you can express on right that. no I, okay so i see where you're going from it it's, relates to a presentation that rob and i saw a guy named bob robbins give it in <laughs> tadwig recently so yeah um there's some big heavy thinking about that sort of two sides of the graph as you say and i and there's two ways to look at your question one question is is genomics alone going to solve the micro side and the other question is can genomics solve the macro side a and I don't think anyone who purports to have an answer to that knows what they're talking about. In other words, I think anyone who tried to answer that question would reveal themselves as someone who's simply answering the question without actually knowing, because I don't think we know at this stage where it can go. I mean, there's a few things. One fundamental question on the prokaryotic side that I don't even really know the answer. Brian, you might know the answer, but I, I, I've been told if I took a sample of soil out of San Diego Bay and sequenced it, I'd find 10,000 of what the equivalent we would call species, you know, or sort of genomes. Now, if I took that same, uh, you know, sample of soil off England, or if I took that same sample soil off China, would those be the same 10,000 microbes, or would it be zero overlap, or you know? I, and so, and 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 I just saw you do this, meaning we don't know the answer to that very fundamental question. I assume, yeah, l yeah. I'd be curious to hear what you have to yeah, say. Yeah, about. The, the the problem is um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, th there are examples of species that, what let's say prokaryotic species as we define them at present, to keep everyone happy, um, that are globally distributed. Yeah, so if you go and sample, let's say, in the ocean, you'll find the same organism in front of Hawaii, you'll find it in the English Channel and so on, but you'll also find species distributions that are different, mm -hmm. okay? And what we're doing at the moment, I think, this is the thing you have to realize is very important. You talk about the genome. We're involved in a project in the, in the DSM advertising now for collections, <laughs> German collection of microorganisms. We started with the JGI, and we did, did a small project, 80 organisms. And the number of genes we found that you didn't know what they were doing exploded. Mm. And this is the point that comes in with the microbiological section. They're small, but they're hugely diverse. They're doing far more things than, should we say, vertebrates can do. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of things. They can fix CO2, okay? And someone says, but plants do this. No, it's the chloroplast. Mm -hmm. The chloroplast is a cyanobacterium. The mitochondria, all these kind of things that the role of the prokaryotes is vastly underestimated mm -hmm. because the number of organisms we've named. But they're out there. We have 800 to 1,000 different organisms living in our gut. They're not all pathogens. They make sure we're fit and healthy. You see this in the news all the time. And this is the point, I think, that you're, you're split between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. No. You have exactly the same problem. You have to link what the organism's doing with what's encoded on the genome. Mm -hmm. And this is the huge problem that's going to come up. We're seeing this coming up more and more. You go for the normal, the known pathways, no problem. But then you find things you don't know what it's doing. And then right. you've got to chase after it. So just to be clear, I wasn't saying that these are fundamentally different forms of life. What I, and, and, you know, it was basically just that the genomics are taking off now in the microbial world more efficiently than they are in the macro world. And I think coming back to Rob's question, part of the reason for that is that you can 
you can mass sequence large diversities of microbial organisms more efficiently than you can get a zebra, zebra and a you know and a fish and a you know these the, the macroorganisms are sort of the physical acquisition of their genomes is 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 a different animal altogether. It has to do with the Reynolds number situation and, and you know how abundant they are. But I guess I guess. The point that I'd like to amplify that you were saying, Brian, it, my understanding is in that prokaryotic world, it, it gets difficult to think in terms of species and more to think about a whole bag of genes and then different organisms can acquire and lose these genes. And so it's really not a, not a the genomics isn't about the diversity of species. The, the genomics is the diversity of genes and which organism happens to be bearing any particular gene at any time is a consequence of a very localized situation. But the diversity, the value, the value to future of humanity is what those molecular machines do, the fixing of the carbons and the conversion of the sunlight energy into, you know, chemical stored energy. Those kinds of little micro machines probably, as you say, largely exist on that microbial side of the world and are just sort of co-opted by the macro side, you know, as we say, one of my favorite little statistics, and I don't know what the true number is, but something along the lines of 97 to 99% of the cells in your body are non-human, right? I, I mean, so we're basically just big ecosystems for lots of microbial things. We're just the habitat. You know, we think of ourselves as being very important on this planet, but really, we're just there serving the habitat of the microbial world. So it, it's, a, it's a big concept to get your point around, but I guess my bigger concept, I don't know to what extent the microbial world is threatened by this. You know, how many microbes survived each of the five previous extinctions? Maybe all of them, maybe a few of them, I, you know, we have no way really of knowing, of finding out. Um, and, and I guess my answer to that question is, I'd rather, try to catalog this library of Alexandria bef while we still can, rather than wait till afterwards and only then discover why it was such a mistake not to have done so. Um, I, I have a sociological question maybe for the audience as much as for Rich. I think he's, he's put the question out there of why as taxonomists we don't um, pull together behind common projects, and I think we can all easily think of why that's our first response. Um, but can we change our may way of working and actually start doing what the astronomers and the particle physicists have been doing, which is putting our combined weight behind particular objectives that we want to achieve? And I'd be really interested to hear if people in the audience have some perspectives on that. Can we do it? Can we rise to the challenge and actually start playing hardball with the big boys? I don't know. Well, I think one of the advantages that those big projects have is their simplification. They're this one big imaginative idea. So, <clears throat> um, as was mentioned a little earlier, if our focus is what's relevant to us, then we could perhaps look at the Human Genome Project, look at a suite of genes, and say, okay, so what we really need to know is where did these genes come from and who else shares them? And in order to do that, we need to sequence the genomes of every organism mm -hmm. on the planet. Something that... Uh, well, one of the things that uh, over the lunch conversation I had today w made me realize this fairly clearly is that w w the Manhattan Project and space and particle physicists have a strong advantage in that they, the money that's spent ends up going to big corporations in a lot of ways, engineering corporations and, you know, those sort of things. In other words, the, it's easier for a politician to, you know, get behind something that, that feeds the existing uh, economic infrastructure. Whereas in biology, other than the Human Genome Project, for which there are obvious medical imp implications and, and uh, maybe bioprospecting for pharmaceutical implications, most of what I would like to see accomplished in cataloging the global biodiversity doesn't really feed back into global economy that much. It probably would if we understood how to, but we don't really know how it would 
well enough to articulate it so that politicians can get up there on a podium and convince the voters that this is how we should be spending our government dollars. So I, I don't know if that's a solvable problem. That might be the nail in the coffin and the explanation for why we don't have a biological Manhattan Project other than the Human Genome Project. And the reason that's an outlier within biology, I think, is because of the direct ramifications it has to human health. And, you know, and, and, and I read somewhere last night that um, the, the Human Genome Cro Project costs $14 billion but has led to something like 200 or $900 billion in, you know, spin-off industry and all of that sort of thing. So you can make that case that the Human Genome Project's an investment that has not only good for all humanity value to it, but has good for near-term revenue streams on economies. It's harder to make that case if the point you're trying to make is, you know, 20 generations from now, they'll be really grateful we did this, right? It, because there, it's too far removed. And I think that's the basic problem that we're going to have a very hard time overcoming, is, is convincing people to take painful, expensive actions now that aren't going to benefit us or our children or our grandchildren, but will ultimately be of value a few more generations down the road. Thanks. I think Diana said we don't have a simple quick big question. We do have a simple big question. What's out there? Mm. That is a very, very simple question. Um, all species, you mentioned, did try and get at that. And all species was a, was a, a rather cool idea. It kind of got ground, grounded or, or, or sort of wrecked on a whole load of us perhaps looking at individual tools we had to build. Mm -hmm and didn't actually go for broke right from the beginning. It had a million dollars or something to start with. Mm -hmm. um, if it had used more of that in outreach, mm -hmm. in exploring more widely with humanity and with governments, hey, there's a big question here. Right. We can start addressing that, and then you can do this and this and this. Then pharma, then cosmetics can drill into what we're discovering. Um, then countries all around the world can, can get their share of that. Right. Um, there were economic arguments to be made, there are economic arguments to be made, but I think the, the big picture has to be explored. People love stories. Mm. You've just been doing that. Um, we have an infinity of stories, as you say. The, the, the library is not just a set of strings of A's and mm -hmm. C's and G's and T's. It's a whole load of stories which are much more interesting, if you like. Mm -hmm. The stories which are on the other side of your screen, the stories about the legacy stuff we've got already, the stuff we're writing now. Um, we need to bring more of those stories out. And I disagree on your time scale as well. Yes, of course, it's generation on generation. I'm interested in my kids. Mm -hmm. um, I've got an emotional em engagement with how they're going to live in 40 years' time. A lot of people, I think, you can maybe tune into at that level. And I think those are the sorts of things we need to be doing, really hooking onto what drives individuals. Right. They're kids. That drives individuals. You're right, of course. Money drives governments. Hmm. But I think we can, we can do that. And yes, we need to stop fighting. Um, there are some tools we all need. Um, we may have different ways of using them. We may have different ideas about what different species are. But hell, if we just put those aside for a while and started doing the same stuff, yeah. that would work. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, think, I think what you say is fundamentally right. And, and, and the, the whole how do you make people understand, that's kind of where I came with my library metaphor. It, it seems like it's something when I've talked to non-biologists that kind of get their heads around. And, you know, it, but I'm sure there are other ways to frame, frame it other than the one I, way I've done it. But, but, but I, I mean, I think you're fundamentally right. I think it, it's a matter of helping non-biologists understand why it matters. And I guess the first question we have to ask is, does it matter? Obviously, to all of us as biologists, of course it matters. Why do you even dare ask that question? But maybe we need to step outside ourselves and say, really, does it matter? And I think you can make a case that it does. And that's where I think in terms of multiple generations beyond just my grandkids, because that's probably where we're really going to be able to start understanding metaphors and Shakespearean equivalents of genomes. You know, I don't know that we'll get... And so I guess the question is, if we focus only a couple of generations down the road, are we going to have a deliverable, maybe we can, maybe we can't, that sort of justifies the upfront investment? And, and the main reason for the need for the big upfront is the race against time. It's, it's, it's the, you know, and so we kind of need to front load the investment in order to combat this, this race that we might potentially be losing. But I, Fundamentally agree with what you were saying, though. 
Oh, oh, he, he, was, he was first. Yeah. Oh. I was just going to say that uh, one of the big problems, I think, in getting things through to governments for funding is that biodiversity is seen as a constraint for planning. This comes across a great deal in the UK. You have a government which has systematically here uh, basically castrated the conservancy and environmental agencies for nature protection. They don't want surveys done. They don't want science for special interests because they affect where you can put houses and particularly where you can put the HS2 route. Yeah. And so I don't know quite how you get around that, but it would have to be something that was really uh, a sea change in the way governments think about priorities, and that's you know what gets you through the next election. Right, I, d I do fully agree with you that, uh, um, and it's one of the challenges that we face that maybe the particle physicists and astronomers didn't have to face. Um, but I guess you know we have a choice of acknowledging this and then you know saying, oh well, I'm going to live out the rest of my life, or we can start that process that might take decades of changing people's minds. And if we are to go with the idea of how, let's start thinking about how we're going to change it. You know, we got to start now because every year that passes is a year that we're not moving in that direction. And then um, thanks for that. Um, I was really intrigued by your graph of all the different projects and how they've been funded and the thing that we have to start now in trying to change minds. Yeah. But when you look at the Apollo mission and the finding the Higgs boson, maybe it tells us something about human nature that they're very positive. They mm. were things that we wanted to go out there. And a problem we encounter here on a daily basis at the museum and anybody talks about conservation is mm. fatigue. It seems to be such yep. an inherently negative message that people switch off. Yep. So how can we make what is an ambitious, wonderful project seem ambitious and wonderful? Right. No, I 100% agree. We were just talking about that exact same point. You know, you can't use extinction as your motivating factor to get on board with this because it's such a downer and people don't want to hear about it. And, you, you know, you can't. Conservation is always wagging the finger. It's like, thou shalt not harm the environment. So, yeah, I, there's definitely that problem. And the, the balance is... How do you convey the urgency, which is fundamentally driven by this potential for extinction, in a way that focuses on the positive, like Chris was talking about? Or what are the cool stories of biodiversity that are out there? How do you excite and enrich people? It's like, man, if we knew more about you know this ecosystem, imagine the cool things that would come. Here's this cool, you know, focus on. I think there's probably a, a decent balance of both to be done. But I completely agree with you, and that may be one of our flaws historically has been focusing on the downside. And maybe a model we can look at is the climate change folks. I mean, the, the climate change people, they don't have an International Space Station singular project worth hundreds of billions of dollars, but they definitely got in the radar of the public consciousness, and they're definitely more funded now than they were 10, 15 years ago, and their basic story is one of doom and gloom. So somehow they managed to navigate those waters, and maybe they would be a good model for us to look into to figure out how to do that. I'd, I'd like to add a little something onto the, the comment about um, where we get pushback. Um, and I think another side of the science funding pr problem is that there's been a great and probably justified emphasis on hypothesis-driven science, but what's just been proposed here is basically uh, cataloging with very sophisticated tools. It's not necessarily hypothesis-driven unless you, um, it's often an artificial construct of a very small hypothesis compared to the amount of effort. So how do we, how do we get over that aspect where, um, I'm, I, I'm not sure we're gonna have an answer, but, but we need to be aware that perhaps the way that we look at science and value science should shift a little bit from the way it's been over the last um, several decades that the um, Kuhnian paradigm maybe needs a little bit of shaking up. Well I guess one thing I would say, though, is that if we were to scale up to hundreds of billions of dollars in funding somehow, if we magically pulled that thing off, um, that wouldn't be hundreds of billions of dollars spent on taxonomy and nomenclature and, and cataloging. I mean, in the same way, I, I think the ratio in value between taxonomy and biodiversity is about equivalent to the ratio in value between a card catalog and a library, right? The card catalog doesn't contain the information. The card catalog is your index to how you get access to the information. And I think that metaphor carries true. It, it's, it's a small, the card catalog is physically a small part of any major library, both in terms of information content and and in terms of physical space, if you, if you use that as a metaphor for dollars spent. But it's absolutely fundamentally important to making the library useful. And so, so it's one of those things that would be an obvious no-brainer core step in a large-scale funding. But in my mind, 
the hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe 1% of that would be spent on the cataloging stuff. The other 99% would be spent on maybe more hypothesis, maybe you know more traditional science. But 1% of that scale of money, since it's four orders of magnitude more, is still three or two orders of magnitude more than we're used to getting funded. For, you know, you see what I'm saying? So, so it's a it's a small slice to a very large pie, and so so my approach would be rather than promote just the value of building the card catalog, see how important this card catalog has been, scale it up a bit and say this is why the whole thing matters, and oh by the way, the card catalog is a really fundamentally important part of it. Do we have further questions? Well, with that. Well, thank you very much. I hope I didn't waste too much of your time, but I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for coming. <laughs>